super, super thrilled to be part of this illustrious group of channels about the general care of the Phalaenopsis orchid, which everybody seems to have mixed feelings about. So let me get that out of the way. When I look at Phalaenopsis orchids, I get such satisfaction, such pleasure. If I were a moth, I would love them because that's what they're called as well, moth orchids. And I'm happy to be a peasant owning peasant orchids, which is what they're also called. All of these different ways of describing a Phalaenopsis orchids, I will attribute and consider myself part of that because I love Phalaenopsis orchids. And when I see something like this, I find great joy. The longevity of the blooms is indisputable. The cost these days as well, I mean, here in southern Spain where I'm at, they are still quite expensive. They don't come with any kind of decorative pot or anything like that. It is common for us here in Spain to have Phalaenopsis orchids everywhere, and usually they are only bought for the blooms and then binned as well, but they are more on the pricey side so it is actually a commodity that you're trying to save, keep, and have rebloom. Our prices usually go from 10 euros, which is super, super rare, but I was lucky enough to find one at that price, and they can go all the way up to 45 to 50 euros. And honestly, that is not a commodity that I would just buy for the blooms and then throw away. There's a little bit of a different opinion here in Spain about Phalaenopsis orchids. They are not cheap, and for that reason, People love them and try to take care of them, and more often than not, they fail. Thank you very much, Michael, for letting me join in. I really appreciate it. You've been on my channel long enough to know that I have been struggling with Phalaenopsis complex hybrids with my setup in my climate and because I am stubborn. So I take full responsibility for all my failures, but I also take full responsibility for the spectacle you see here now. <laughs> And I am over the moon that I do believe that I've cracked the code of getting a Phalaenopsis complex hybrid to transition from bark into LECA and self-watering, including a dry top layer, no humidity, and including very, very cold winters in my dining room in which we find ourselves right now. There's way too much sun outside and I wouldn't be able to comfortably tell you how I take care of my orchids with them being outside and the sun moving in quickly because no direct sun in my climate on these leaves at all, ever. It happens very fast that they heat up and they will burn and then all the gorgeous foliage that I've been trying to grow will have a mark because the leaves take forever then also to fall off and you are left with this blemish for a long, long time. So I don't have them in direct sun ever. What you see here is, let's say, the east side of my dining room. And normally they do not live on this top shelf. In the winter, I have them on the rack below. You can see those right there. And then I have the shop lights above. And the shop lights are enough with the distance to the orchid that they are not getting too much light, but they're also getting some light. This is a brand new setup for this past winter where I could have the big ones now on the shelf that you see. Because finally, having cracked the code of getting them to transition, their leaves are enormous and space has become an issue. So let me just, this is huge. This is not even one of the bigger fowls that I have. These leaves are enormous. So I have them spread around depending on the size. And some of them live on the shelf, which I will insert a picture right now, where they get residual light from the blurple lights that I have for the rest of my orchids. The only complex fowls that get any sort of light directed at themselves are the ones on the metal rack on the east side. The shelving that you see on the right, I would consider the west side of my dining room. The lighting from my blurple lights on the ceiling has to be sufficient for those fowls on the top shelf. I used to be able to fit six comfortably, now I can only fit four. So they don't get much light from me in the winter at all. And that is why I will be forfeiting having massive spectacular bloom spikes. I have 
plenty of blooms to show for this time, but I know that when I bought them, I had probably double the bloom size when they arrived in my home. And that is only because of light. You see, we say Phalaenopsis light as a reference with regards to not too much light for an orchid or they can live in some, some kind of a shady environment. But the more light you can give them without burning the leaves, the more of a bloom spectacle you will get. I have to have a very, very fine balance in the winter. Space is an issue when all the orchids come in because until about November, 80% of my collection is outdoors. And these Phalaenopsis complex hybrids can spread out nicely in the dining room, consider it their own, and they get the best direction of light that I can offer each one without snapping aerial roots, without bending any of the leaves. My dining room temperatures in the winter have gone down to 14 degrees Celsius. That is not ideal for a complex hybrid Phalaenopsis, which prefers no less than 18 degrees Celsius. In my case, because I'm growing with LECA and self-watering, I prefer, <laughs> the ideal would be not to go lower than 20 degrees Celsius because of the evaporative cooling that the LECA and self-watering has on the roots. Guesstimating three degrees different ambient air, let's say is 20 degrees, the pot would be about 17 degrees Celsius. Bring that to 14 degrees ambient air, my Phalaenopsis orchids have to tolerate possibly 11 degrees in their roots during the winter. And that is a very, very dangerous, dangerous temperature for these warm growers, because they are. The lowest they should get is 18 degrees. And in my case, even that is too low. So I am super happy that I have successfully managed to pull everyone through the winter and how I do that is keeping the LECA now a little bit on the drier side. I never let my microfiber go dry. I always make sure that the microfiber and the LECA stay somewhat wet. I do not want to desiccate any roots that are in the pot but my reservoirs are pretty much empty all the time. How I do that is by flushing the pots through and then letting it drain and putting it back in the mask and then leaving them alone. If I have to, I will miss the surface of my pots because we can get some warmer days. The terrace door is open and the top layer will dry out and I will miss the surface of my pots, but very, very carefully. In some cases, I have sphagnum moss around the base of the orchid to help me where I should put the sprayer as opposed to getting right to the base, avoiding any possible dangers of rot. And in other cases, I just have a microfiber that I target and I missed just the microfiber to up the humidity level around the surface without getting towards the base of the orchid. Winters for me are always touch and go. I'm always somewhat nervous about having them that cold, but it is what it is. I do not supplement with heaters or heat mats in my dining area. So whoever decides to survive and thrive, I am very, very happy. And whoever doesn't make it, of course it saddens me, but the circumstances are such, I cannot be putting any more costs into heat mats and heaters. Very, very little fertilizer in the winter. The upside to having such drastic temperature changes is the fact that they will spike quite quickly when the temperatures drop, but late considering when all the other fowls in the world start to spike. My Indian summers can be very, very mild all the way up to mid-November. But then when the temperature does drop, probably by mid-December, I have signs of spikes, which then will start developing throughout the season. And I do train my spikes by light. I don't stake them as you can see, but if I have, for example, my fowl in spike, I will always make sure it goes back on the shelf in exactly the same position so that I don't get a bendy spike going all over the place. That is another very delicate maneuver with a very limited space when all the orchids are inside. Make sure that no spikes get knocked, but they do spike very quickly, even though be it late considering when all other fells start to go into bloom, some of mine are still in bud. Now they're gonna stay in bloom for probably until July, if I let them, and it depends on which orchid, case by case, I allow that to happen. First of all, because they bloom so very long, very rarely 
do mine actually start vegetative growth while they are in bloom. If I want to have blooms the next season, they're gonna have to push out two more leaves super quickly because without two more leaves, there are no new growth points for new spikes. And then I usually get one very long leaf and then I get one leaf that comes out a little bit smaller. And that is because of the fact that I have such a short time frame of growth between when the vegetative growth starts and then when the temperature drop starts. And that is why sometimes I will cut off the spike prematurely to give the orchid an additional two months in order to actually get some vegetative growth going. So in the summer, inside my dining room, it'll always be 20, 22 degrees at night. Sometimes in July and August, the whole thing shoots up and can easily get to 26, 28 degrees. Something that these fowls absolutely love. That is their time for growth, for roots, for leaves, the whole nine yards. When they start to spike in the winter, I flush them with CalMag and seaweed. And then when they have their spikes going, obviously they're going to be more active. So I leave like a little bit, like a centimeter of whatever has drained out of the pot while I flush in the reservoir. So it's not like I'm fertilizing them and then leaving the reservoir full. The flush will retain the calcium magnesium in the pot as well as the seaweed plus the microfiber will still be able to wick up a little bit of those nutrients but it's not sopping wet but I do make sure that as they start their spikes they get some calcium magnesium I don't do a lot with the MSU fertilizer I have to be very careful how much I put into the pots I do not want mineral buildup because I have a dry top layer which could in turn burn surface roots as they come and touch the leka. I know this all sounds very very complicated but these are the things that I have failed at for many many years in trying to get them to grow successfully and bloom and thrive so in the winter I will fertilize at 300 parts per million once they start to spike. I flush them through with that solution of seaweed and calcium magnesium, let a little bit of what is draining out into the reservoir, about a centimeter or two centimeters depending. And when they've absorbed all of that, they get a proper flush then with plain RO water. And then I just flush the last flush through again with calcium magnesium and leave a little bit in the reservoir. Prior to spiking, none of that happens. The reservoir remains empty, just the microfiber stays wet. In the summer, much easier. Throw everything at them as fast as possible is all I can say, especially while they're in bloom right now. I have to be very mindful with regards to my terrace door being open because I've had bud blast. You can see right here, one of them has blasted, but that to me is, oh, it doesn't, doesn't phase me at all. I'm really pleased only one blasted because for the sake of the ambience in the house, I always have my terrace doors open. I need them open. So if there's a cooler breeze coming or like early in the year, I used to flush them outside when it was warm enough. Now I can't because the sun is so high in the sky. I do everything indoors with these guys. But the minute you move them, they are susceptible to bud blast. But in the summer, like now, I know we are only in May, but now they're getting full on 300 parts per million. Sometimes I give them 400 parts per million of MSU fertilizer. And between every time I fill the reservoir, I flush them through twice using their respective masks as a measure for how much RO water I pour through them. And then I fill the reservoir up again with MSU fertilizer. But while they're in bloom like this, Yes, they still need the nutrients, but that's not going to kickstart any active growth. So let me move in a little bit and I'll show you the two that are not in spike and why they are not in spike and how they are doing. So here's a hybrid that I've always struggled with. This would be the third that we have bought into this house. I call her Bubba. Thank you, Michael McCarthy, for the real name, Champion Lightning. I really appreciate that. I don't have the heart to change the tag, but I do now remember the name. So thank you for that very much. This one was a very healthy plant at it in its time, but this hybrid has always been a problem for me in transitioning it. And just because of the sentimental value, I do keep trying with it. But recently I took the spike off because it was draining the orchid 
the leaves were starting to flop, despite the fact that I was treating it in the pot, like I would every other fowl that you see. Being in bloom, the leaves were flopping, so there's a problem in the roots. These leaves tell a story, and when they started to look leathery, I thought, yeah, we've got root issues again, also because I know that this hybrid has always been a problem. Every single time I bought one to replace the previous one that failed, same thing. So this was a little bit of more, more of a tough one for me to get right. But I have her lower in the pot using the orchid as a support. There is one, one good root in that pot that I'm banking on. And I'm getting a new root growing here and leaf growth already. Having taken the spike off maybe four weeks ago, there's a video and I'll leave a, a card for you if you want to go check that out. But I took the spike off prematurely to save the health of the orchid and to kickstart vegetative growth, which is much more important than the blooms, even though, you know, I love the blooms, but I put them in a vase and I still could enjoy them. So I have already initiated vegetative growth way ahead of time with this orchid as opposed to all the others who are not starting anything because they are still in bloom. The same here with Ninja Yellow. She wanted to spike again, but the same thing is, I don't like that this leaf looks like so. I need a little bit more healthy looking leaves for me to be able to say, you can bloom. All this one wants to do is bloom. And that is a signal for me of stress bloom. A Phalaenopsis will bloom once a year, no matter how many spikes, residual spikes you left on the fowl from previous years, if the spike hasn't been absorbed, it can branch. But literally once a year, it will bring out a new spike. Again, not counting the spikes it had from previous years if you leave them on. But a Phalaenopsis orchid that keeps throwing out more and more spikes from similar nodes, but doesn't have any more growth points, that is stress. Those are not healthy spikes. She's fighting for survival, and the only way I can help her is by removing the spikes, which is always a shame, of course, but it is better for the health of the orchid not to invest that energy and focus on getting active with regards to vegetative growth and root growth. Now, she has a lot of roots in the pot, and even some are crawling out. So why am I doing this? Well, I want her to focus on getting strong and healthy leaves. If she keeps chucking out all the spikes down in this area, that's stress. That is not an orchid that is happy and wants to just bloom because it's her time of year. She is doing that because she wants to make sure that she survives. When I cut the spikes off a stress orchid, I do wait until the buds show. I do let her extend that energy to the letting the buds show because if you cut the spike off too soon, it'll then start the process of sending out another spike very, very quickly. And that is not the point of the exercise to be cutting spikes off for it and to push more energy into another spike. A spike to me needs to have buds on it, not colored up, but budding in order for me to cut it off without then the orchid triggering another spike. This one is an exception. No matter when I cut the spike off, she wants to try again. But I think now we're past that phase because I'm seeing a little bit of a root tip activating there again. And again, she's healthy on the root front inside the pot, but I do want now the leaf growth to start a little bit more aggressively. I don't need her to be sitting around with four leaves only. So that is what I try to do to make sure that my fowls stay healthy. I will sacrifice spikes. In the winter of 2019, I cut 13 spikes off all the fowls that you see in bloom here today. And that wasn't easy. It was really, really hard to do. Now that I've done it and I've seen some results, I still struggle with cutting spikes, but it's not really, really hard anymore. It is just hard. <laughs> so we've gotten better about it. I want to show you another one with regards to how quickly vegetative growth starts once a spike is done blooming. You see that? This is Aurora 2.0. She is still in bark. But look, the last two blooms only just fell off two days ago, and she's already starting on a new leaf. This is what I like to see. 
because this gives me a great opportunity until November for more vegetative growth and for better roots because look at the damage of those roots. She really needs help. But the fact that she's already growing a leaf after having finished blooming naturally, I did not cut these off. She's absorbing some of the spike now. She's already actively growing. And that is why I cut spikes off because of this dynamic that I've seen over the years. Once they're in spike, that's all they focus on. They don't care. They don't care about roots. They don't care about leaves. In my climate, I have to be super careful how much time am I going to give my fowls for vegetative growth to be able to produce two healthy, strong leaves, hopefully of the same size. And if they bloom until July, August, September, and October, November, that's four months before the temperatures drop because once they start to bring out their spikes, they stop growing their leaves and focus on spikes only. So in four months to get two leaves, it's a very short period of time. I do enjoy these blooms, but now I'm going orchid by orchid, depending on who's doing what and what can I allow that orchid to do. Absolutely, I'm a big, big fan of these. They have challenged me over the years to such a degree that I was so frustrated. You see, the thing is that not because of the orchids, but because they're always gifts. People know I like to grow orchids. People give me a phalaenopsis. I'm like, stop, no more phalaenopsis for me, none, until I haven't figured this out. And anyway, now that I don't have any more space, no way. But because they are always gifts, it is so hard to lose one. There's a sentimental attachment to them. So all of my fowls here have a story. And I mentioned that in another video, I introduced them, except for Maxi here. Maxi was not in that video. But you can see, there's Maxi. That was the fowl that was with Big Brother here. So I've got Maximilian here and Maxi. They were all in the same display. I was not going to let Maxi bloom this year, but what a healthy little orchid. And that's why he is in bloom. Doing really, really well. Finally, finally. Now, Maxi has never been a problem for me, but there was a moment where I thought this isn't going well. And I was going to cut the spike off and then suddenly it started to go chugging along. And I thought, yeah, no, you're fine. The leaves are superb. That's fine for letting it bloom. I was going to put it down here, otherwise I might break something. And then also what we, who we didn't see was Hot Kiss. This is the first ever big lip fowl that I've got in my collection. I never saw them in the stores, so I bought Hot Kiss here, big lip. And now I have Bubblicious, big lip. And I have a beautiful white one that is also a big lip. Anyway, you can see where this is going and I can see from the timestamp that I've got here on my camera how long this video has been. I hope it wasn't too long-winded, but I have to say that I have to also tell you my struggles initially so that you understand where my care is coming from. It's not about me just throwing the orchids into a pot and it's self-watering and we're off and good to go. For me, this has been a journey, a long journey. I never had issues with Phalaenopsis complex hybrids in bark, ever. Put them in Lekka, that's where my issues started but I think I've got it. I will also be doing a video with regards to transitioning and the dangers of the transitioning, but how to go or get around those without any fancy kit caboodle or frills, because that is how I grow here. No kit, no caboodle, no supplementation except for lights, and it's working. Watch out for that video. It's going to be in collaboration with another channel, but yeah, I'm, I'm really sorry for this video to be so long. If you have any questions with regards to what I said, did I circle back in an acceptable manner or not, please let me know in the comments below. I might be going off on a tangent every once in a while, but there's so much information in my head with regards to how I managed to transition Phalaenopsis into Lekka and self-watering without having any, any outside assistance apart from trial and error. 
just one quick add-on, if you don't mind. Bubblicious was transitioned last year in July. Fabulous. This is my showcase. It's working. What I've figured out is working and the roots are in the reservoir, have actually grown through the pot and are now in the reservoir. I've got water roots. Incredible. Whether the roots will survive is another subject all of its own, but this is a successful transition based on what we're going to be doing in another video coming up eventually, but that is why I ramble, because this is not just throw a fowl into Lekka and it'll be fine. There's temperatures involved, that I don't have in the winter, and then how to get a fine balance and tiptoe my way through the colder months of the year, because everything is easier once the temperatures reach 20 degrees Celsius at night in my climate. So, wow, if you've made it this far, thank you so very, very much. I really appreciate your time. I know this is not a popular orchid for everybody. The fact that you're here, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. And, and also to Michael for letting me join in. Despite knowing my headaches and my issues with fowls in self-watering and lecca. Thank you, Michael, very much for letting me join in. I hope I didn't waste your time. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everybody. Appreciate having you here. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.